Welcome to the Alouettes Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouettes football. I am Tim Capper. You can find me on Twitter at Repact. That's R-E-P-P-A-C-T. And I'm Cliffy D. You can also find me on Twitter, but at Cliffy D. And this episode of the Alouettes Flight Deck podcast is presented by our good friends over at Sportbuff, where right now, if you use the promo code FLIGHTDECK-10, you will save 10% off your entire order. Head on over to www.sportbuffshop.com for all of your sporting good needs. And don't forget, we are on social media. You can find our main page over at alouettesflightdeck.ca, where you can find all of our links. But you can also find the entire archive, all seven years of our uh, collective talkings about the Alouettes all these years. Uh, you can also head find us over on Twitter, and that is at Alouettes FL Deck Instagram. Alouettes Flight Deck, Instagram.com slash Alouettes Flight Deck, Facebook, search for Alouettes Flight Deck Pod. Our merchandise is found over at teespring.com slash store slash Alouettes Flight Deck. I know Cliff and his significant other are going to be getting in a pretty big care package very, very soon of new merch. And lastly, mm-hmm. but not leastly, does that really exist? Um, it does now. You can find us on YouTube, Cliff, but Cliff. Yes. Would you like to know where you can find us on YouTube? Do tell. YouTube.com slash Alouette's Flight Deck. Shut the front door. You can. We've got a URL. We got it. Finally got our URL. Thanks to everybody for getting us there. We have finally unlocked that special feature from, from YouTube and unlocked the upcoming draw. Finally. (laughs) Finally. (laughs) For Y'all realize we're giving away some awesome swag. I know. Thank you for joining us, folks. Yes. Thanks for cluing in and realizing, hey, these guys are giving away a pretty sweet jacket. Yes. Uh, the Delta jacket, satin Delta jacket. By the way, if you still haven't subscribed, though, please still do. We'd like to stay over that triple digit mark and grow and grow and grow, especially with the, the new stuff that we've been adding as of late. Um, mm. So, yes, please, please do. Uh, but again, thanks everybody for all that you've done. We greatly appreciate it and stay tuned for the upcoming draw where you can win that Delta jacket. So, hey, should we do that one live? Should we do that one on YouTube? Why? I think it'd be pretty crazy not to. Mm-hmm. I, I think we owe it to our 100 plus subscribers to do that draw mm-hmm. on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Make it a live stream or something, anything. We've got to do something to reward these people for smacking that subscribe button mm. the same way that Najee Murray and Wesley Sutton smack the ball away from opposing receivers. <laughs> and we encourage you people to keep smacking the subscribe button. Tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your family, tell everybody, go to the Alouette's flight deck YouTube page, hit the subscribe button, tell your friends, tell everybody, let everybody know what's going on on YouTube with the Alouette's flight deck. Exactly. By the way, um, before, obviously it's been a huge week. I don't know what it is about weeks prior to bye weeks and weeks up leading up to the next game after a bye week. To, God forbid what's going to happen in two weeks. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get to that, I want to at least mention, if you didn't see on social media, and Cliff tell you about it a little bit, uh, I was able to uh, meet up with the uh, lovely guys over at Sport Buff. I went over and joined uh chris and gary at the warehouse uh, i was nice chatting with them i had not seen them in years i think it's probably close to th- wow probably close to 25 to 30 years since i've actually seen them S- still the guys still as nice as as usual they look you know they really have not changed in any way shape or form over these years but it was nice to see the internal workings of sportbuffshop.com and see what their warehouse is like, and to see, I was like, you know, was able to see a sneak peek of all the uh, turf tradition caps that were just released by them this week, and by a lot of the other teams also. Um, but I know there's a lot more merch coming. So, but um, it's again, Cliff, a very. I don't know if you ever, if you've known somebody who works in a warehouse or owns a a shop, you know, based off of a, I guess, a web store. I guess we could say, but it was a unique situation to check out to see what they had and how it was done. So it's uh, yeah. You know, again, it, it was it was it was really cool to see, and uh, thanks to th- thanks to them again for entertaining us or entertaining me, allowing me to see them, <laughs> and, uh, and to finally officially and uh, welcome them to the uh, uh, flight deck family. And I, I, again, as everybody saw in the picture on social media, they now own one of our 
flight deck caps. So that's pretty awesome. So the fact that we're giving the merch guys merch is pretty outstanding. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad you got the chance to, to, to see the guys and, uh, you know, just great to be able to touch base uh, with uh, our present presenting sponsors. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like I said, folks, these are the guys that help make the flight deck, flight crew seats available to you for each and every home game. Mm-hmm. So, by all means, folks, as I said, we've got a great, great promo code, uh, save some money, you know, ordering some great merch. By all means, definitely go check out sportbuffshop.ca. Exactly. And, com, sorry. And speaking of, by the way, great segue, Cliff, we do want to congratulate uh, Vicky Otto for being the winner of this week's uh, Sport Buff Flight crew seats to see the Alouettes play the Ottawa uh, Red Blacks this Friday. Stay tuned uh, following this show coming up on our socials for the next draw. There's many of them in September. The next draw for uh, the next pair of seats. And that will be versus the BC Lions. Vernon Adams' BC, (laughs) BC Lions, which we'll talk about. Um, and that is going to be next Friday, September 9th. And I got a feeling suddenly that game all of a sudden became a very hot ticket. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> Can't imagine why, but suddenly I think the demand for that game is going to be through the roof. <laughs> I don't know why. I have no clue why. Um, but anything else you want to bring up before we talk about this hell of a week? Well, just that, uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but laugh. Like uh, the news that we'll be talking about today, like I, all I can think about is so much for a nice peaceful bye week where you know you, know, you, you kind of expect the players just to go home relax recharge the batteries you know see family you know all that I'm like okay you no know, I'm, I'm you know i'm glad they had the chance to rest up and uh you know go see their friends family what have you and you know come back and now you're going to prepare for a pretty big homestand and let's face it folks <laughs> four games in a row being played at Percival molson stadium i mean that's that's pretty huge right there mm-hmm. so I was thinking, okay, just a nice peaceful bye week would be fantastic. You know, let the guys come back. They'll be rested, ready to go, raring to go even, especially too, considering that this is going to be the kickoff to Labor Day weekend mm-hmm. this uh, coming Friday versus the Ottawa Red Blacks. Mm-hmm. So, like, all right, I'm ready. But uh, that didn't quite work out the way we thought it would or hoped it would. <laughs> Neither did that. Well, remember what happened last bye week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Change of yeah. change of scenery and again change of wow. Okay, anyway, let's get to this thing. First and foremost, as we found out, I, I guess it was a bombshell that was started with, and it was funny that Gary Stern's letter mentioning that he was stepping down as I guess the day from the day to day operations of the Montreal Alouettes. It was not sent through the team, but sent through a. Um, a company that distri- distributes press releases. Mm. What, that's the first thing that I thought was very interesting. Um, second of all, the first time that we heard the Alouettes actually talk about it was when Mario uh, Ciccini said something after practice, which was six hours later, something like that. Yep. Mm-hmm. That that boggled my mind. Um, but let's let's get to what we what we know. And, I, and this is some of the stuff I didn't know either. So we know we now know that Gary Cern owned 25% of the Montreal Alouettes through the, I think it was the SNS Sportico name, with originally the other 75% being Sid Spiegel before he passed, and which is now owned by the estate, by his estate. of Sid Spiegel, which for those who, who can think of an analogy to this, think about the analogy for the BC Lions. That's who owns the BC Lions now, or used to own the BC Lions, right? Used, correct. Yeah, yeah. It was the estate of David Braley, correct? But now it's uh, in, until it was purchased by Amar Do, Dolan, mm-hmm. Dolan. Mm-hmm. But yes, it was the estate that had uh, was basically overseeing the day to day operations of the BC Lions. Right. So Gary has stepped down, and, and as Mario has let us know that uh, somebody, uh, somebody, sometime this week, he's going to be speaking with uh, whoever is going to be the new representative. Of the team and of the, uh, you know, of the estate, who will be, I guess, again, the point two person, who the team will report to. So it begs to differ the question here, Cliff, what happened? Um, what, what happened for Gary to become what I coined 
He basically became the Jim Spiros of 2022 for the Alouettes. And if people who don't know that don't know that analogy, I will explain. Back in 96, when the team moved to Montreal, the face of the Alouettes in 96 was Jim Spiros, as he was in Baltimore for the Stallions. But the thing is, Jim Spiros was not the owner. He was the face. He, was, he wasn't the money guy. It was uh, David, Gel, um, David Gelfan, I think, if I remember correctly. He was the actual m- money guy. So this is the same case that happened to Gary. Even though Gary was the guy who was coming off like the owner, you know, doing all the talking and all the stuff they did on social media and stuff like that, you know, doing all the press and stuff, he wasn't the controlling partner. Right. So it seems now something has occurred, something that was done, we can speculate that now Gary has taken a step back. He will still own the 25% of the team. He made that clear. And I think multiple people within the uh, organization have made that clear. Mm -hmm. But he won't be the guy. He he, uh, will this new, you know, he won't, he won't be the, again, he won't be the face. Now the question is, will this new person take more of an active role like Gary did? Or will we go back to how it kind of was with the, you know, I guess many previous <laughs> many previous owners like the Wetinals, where there really wasn't much that came from the from the ownership group itself. No, there really wasn't. You knew of them, you knew that they were there, but uh, they certainly did not have the presence, if you will, that Gary Stern had. And the one thing that the uh, the estate of Sid Spiegel made very clear was that they consider things to be business as usual. They are still very much committed to the Alouettes. They're very much committed to making sure the bills are paid and making sure everybody's paid. Like as far as they're concerned, it's business as usual. Mm -hmm. Like they, they are just now, I guess, taking more of an controlling interest of the team itself. And I guess kind of scaling back Gary's visibility, if you will, I guess kind of, I want to say necessarily muting him, but I guess for all intents and purposes, Kind of is because he's deleted his Twitter account, exactly, which yeah. he became a became a, a, a media darling as a result of. To uh, some, to some, well, can, uh, can, yes, to some. But I mean, can, like, can, listen, like we we had him on the show, and we we absolutely loved talking with him. I mean, he was absolutely great as far as we were concerned. But not everybody agreed. Uh, certainly, not a, a lot of people within the Alouettes organization seemed to be not too. I guess wary i guess would be the best way to describe how they felt every time he would tweet something and again it was just, listen he was sharing his opinion he he said himself i'm a fan i'm a passionate fan i really care about this team i really believe that they're a great football team and i want to let everybody know about it mm-hmm. and maybe it was just the way he came across i guess to some people may have seemed abrasive uh, i know a lot of people like to nitpick over his uh, spelling and punctuation and nonsense like that i'm like oh, okay i don't know if you've been on twitter but i, I was mean about to say, it's that's not exactly that's the internet it's not exactly a spelling bee and uh, it's not exactly english class i mean i've seen some pretty brutal tweets as well from lots of other so-called uh, successful business types or uh, you know, supposed intelligence. Oh, uh, have you have you seen people. the states? Have you seen the state of some of the newspapers these days? Oh my goodness! And some like, of the and don't, some don't, of the spelling don't. mistakes and blatant blatant grammatical oh, errors. Well, I, I I will say like let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Mm-hmm. Believe me, everybody's made either a social faux pas or a spelling mistake or some sort of grammatical error. I mean, it's not perfect. So, you know, and Gary Stern never claimed to be perfect as well. At the end of the day, you got to see his passion. You got to see how he felt about this team. And you could tell he was a huge football fan, a huge CFL fan, and most importantly, a huge Montreal Alouettes fan. Mm-hmm. And I think that really endeared him to a lot of people. Like a lot of people got on board, were excited to see him tweet, excited to get his thoughts on things. And, yeah, did things go a little too far? Maybe, maybe it made some people uncomfortable. But you know, that's kind of what Twitter is. It's just, it's getting out there and having a conversation. It's reaching out to people and interacting with them, and 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 just having a conversation. That's really what it came down to. And I think that's what Gary was trying to do more than anything else was just have a conversation, let people know, like, hey, the Montreal Alouettes, they're a great football team. We're doing everything we can to make this the best football team possible, and we want you all to be on board with it. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, you know, there, I, I don't know what, obviously we also take everything from a grain of salt from what we hear in the, in the news, you know, people said reporting said, and you know, it's, I'm the type of person who's been in in media long enough to know that. And I'm sure there are those veterans out there too, Cliff, that you only try to report something if, if you can get two people to say the exact same thing, 
or to report the same thing. So it, you know, it, I take sometimes the, some of the stuff with a grain of salt. You know, I had heard. You know, I, we saw on social media where people are saying, well, I heard that there was a potential issue with the French fans and how Gary came off or g- how Gary was speaking to fans. I'm thinking, well, I, we, yes, we understand Gary is a steel magnet from Ontario. You know, I, I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember there being an issue in the French media that there was an issue that he didn't know French to begin with. Because I know I think he actually stated that he was going to try, which I think he did. Most do. Most do, and 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 it's, and it's respect for the province, it's respect for the city, and it's respect for the fans. So I don't know where that came from. I mean, it's I don't I don't know where it came off from, but um, you know, and now all of a sudden, this whole hullabaloo and potential cluster has supposedly started where the team's in trouble. You know, they don't believe what's being told to them. You know, it's not business as usual. Yada yada yada. You know, I, I understand what Montreal has gone through. I mean, I've been a fan as I have for, you know, since they've been back. Um, did I actually think that they were, that, uh, did I start screaming the sky is falling when I heard this? I really didn't. I don't think it scared me as much as it scared some of these others. For all we know, and everybody's saying, you know, some, uh, th- it's three to 12 months and then it's going to change potential. But let's see what, let's see what's going to happen first with, you know, with, with the, uh, with the estate, what they're going to do, what this new person says. Maybe this person, whoever it's going to be, will have a, a press conference or will have a, you know, we'll start doing the rounds. You know, we guess we we don't know how much money was put into the Alouettes by Sp- Sid Spiegel. We don't. We don't know how much is in the estate. We don't know if there was an, an issue within the estate with the Alouettes or what was being spent or what was being lost. We don't know this. Mm-hmm. So... As a fan, am I concerned? No, I'm not. But I, it's it's just it, just because this is occurring does not mean that there is an issue in Montreal. Maybe that's me, you know, blinded by the lights type of thing. Just because I'm a fan, it doesn't come off this way like it did before. When the wet and all's left cliff, I was genuinely concerned. Genuinely concerned. You know, when Mister Wet and all died, there was no estate. They wanted out. They'd had the team for, you know, for 20 plus years. Yeah. It's not, I don't, I'm not, I did not, I, I did not get that feeling. I did not feel that way. What about you though? I mean, you heard all the stuff that's, that's being said across social media, on TV, the talking heads, the people in the writing. What were your thoughts when you first heard that Gary was stepping down? Obviously, I'm sure there were questions, but. Oh, there's definitely questions. I mean, when it came to the whole issue with the estate and how the, they felt the team was being run or at least being represented by Mr. Stern. I can understand concerns. I can understand, I guess, the the power structure, if you will, because, uh, yeah, Gary Stern definitely presented himself like he was the owner and like, the, you know, like the, with like, what do you call it? Like complete autonomy. And maybe in some senses he had, he felt he had that. But then all of a sudden when the, uh, the estate decided to, uh, well, hold on here. Uh, we got this football team, and you're doing things, and I don't know if we necessarily agree with how you're doing things. So now you've got this internal struggle, which I think ultimately led to Gary being – is muzzled a good term for this? Because you know, with the fact that he's deleted his Twitter account, and we're not probably going to hear from him again anytime soon. I don't know, but – but now hearing from the estate saying that, you know, things, you know, there's nothing's changed as far as the uh, infrastructure of the ownership group goes. I mean, there's a lot here. to There's really a lot here to digest. And I can see why a lot of naysayers and people would be worried and, you know, all stuff. But, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like you, like, OK, if you're saying, you know, things are going to be business as usual, I mean, it's something to keep in mind that potentially this team could be sold again, like, it's very possible that the uh, Sid Spiegel estate may not want to be in the football business. I mean, Gary Stern certainly seemed like he wanted to be in the football business. Uh, he made that very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know if he's got the uh, the funds or if he knows of people that would be able to kind of go in with him and buy the Alouettes, like the, buy that 75% stakeholder for, uh, percentage from the, uh, the estate and run the team himself as he sees fit. Who knows? I mean, the... There's a lot to consider, but I just think the fact that they've actually come forward and said everything's going to be fine and just, you know, it's business as usual. So, OK, in in that case, let's leave it at that. Let's see what happens. I mean, we could be seeing new ownership in Montreal. We could not. Who 
who's to say? I mean, I know a lot of people were kind of saying, well, why didn't, you know, we had all these Quebec-born investors that were ready to buy the Alouettes and run things and do it from a completely Quebec perspective. And then you get into bed with uh, this uh, steel company from Ontario and let them run a team in Quebec. Like, what's up with that? You know, like, and it just comes back to uh, a lot of people just thinking that Randy Ambrosi doesn't know what the hell he's doing or he's, you know, trying to kowtow to certain people in regards to doing that. Is that the case? I. Oh, the who knows? I mean, it's, with all the question, it, with all the questions going around recently on in French media about would they, you know, they've gone to these people with these the other groups, and would they, if the owls do become available again and they go on the market, would they buy them? Th- there's been interesting reactions to how people are are answering that question. You know, it's gone so as far enough from Vince Guzzo today in French media to say there's no way in hell, I'm paraphrasing, no way in hell I'd buy the team as long as Randy Ambrosi is the commissioner. <laughs> right. Yeah. To, to and, and one the, that you had, you saw that today too, so. Yeah, and that's uh, thanks to uh, TSN's Dave Naylor, who spoke with uh, Jeffrey Lankoff of the uh, Lankoff brothers, who had also put together a bid and was uh, looking to buy the Alouettes. Uh, again, a couple of Montreal-born guys, uh, so I mean, like the, they've got that connection. But uh, the, the talk is that you know, would they be interested in possibly going down that ownership venue again? Possibly, but the way it was kind of phrased was, well, it's certainly an interesting prospect that would be considered, but didn't seem like it was a very hard yes or no. So I mean, I guess kind of leaving it vague, maybe on purpose. Uh, personally, though, I couldn't imagine uh, like Peter Lankoff, his brother, being interested because he's a huge, huge Vernon Adams fan. And I think he'd only want to get back into the game, so to speak, if VA was still a part of things in Montreal. And, well, now, as of today, he's not. So, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, is it a possibility? I mean, everything's a possibility. There's no question about that. But I think that particular ownership group, I don't know if they'd be so interested now, just the way things sit. Just I'll leave it at that. Are you are you concerned that that, that there was a change? You know, it really, and it wasn't an ownership change, as we you know, as we've been saying, it's just a change in and just spokesperson. Yeah, am I concerned? I mean, it's kind of bizarre the way it sort of came about, and like how it just sort of kind of fell out of the sky. <laughs> I mean, this could have definitely been handled a little bit better, but I think a lot of things could have been handled a lot better this year with a lot of things. And mm-hmm. that doesn't just necessarily pertain to ownership. But again, it, it, it's just one of those one of those other yet another instance of you, you just look at the situation. And you're like, what the heck? Like, what what, what am I to make of this? Yeah. Like, it, it's 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 baffling more than anything else. And I think that's really what it is. Is just how do you look at this and you come away with more questions than answers? Like, I, I, I truly think that this, uh, if they say the ownership group is fine and nothing's going to change, then I'm willing to take that at face value. Yeah. Until, until I see otherwise. I mean, if I start seeing other changes, like monumental changes that look like they're going to affect this football team, both on and off the field. Like dumping salary. Potentially. And, and by the way, that's just so people know, I, that's not a slight for what else happened today. That's just an example. No. Because look what, look what the Expos did. We'll go back to not, we'll, what, the, what happened to the Expos was a travesty when Major League Baseball got involved and not allowing yeah. them to call up players for the September call up for the October uh, September call ups and stuff like that. That Oof. that was truly uh, again a travesty and meddling one hundred percent. Anyways, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, okay, with that in mind, the time to to really be worried is when they move half of the Alouettes games to say Moncton to. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, with it. Hey, Expo reference. Nice. Well, hey, listen, you you brought it up. I figured. I know. Let's, let's go with it. Let's P- let's run Puerto with Rico. this. Puerto <laughs> Rico. We're going to Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rico Alouettes. We're going to Puerto Rico. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, are you the are you fans concerned? Uh, how do you feel about the change? The minor change in spokes. You know, the change in, in spokesperson for the Alouettes. I mean, you, you can let us know. There are ways. I mean, you, social media, or you can email us tim.capper at alouettesflightdeck.ca or clifford.pine at alouettesflightdeck.ca. Um, again, let's let's see what happens. We'll go from here. The one thing I will say, though, is at least uh, Mario Ciccini, 
I mean, he's still, as far as I'm concerned, the spokesperson truly for the Alouettes. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to both on and off the field, when you think about it, I mean, he's definitely front and center for the off the field stuff and seemed like is able to weigh in with his opinion on stuff on field as well. And not wanting to get in anyone's affairs, so to speak, like, you know, trying not to tell the mag, like the, on the football operations people how to do their job, but you can tell that he too is also very passionate about the product. He's very, uh, you know, he, he believes strongly in this team as well. And I think he's done a very good job as far as promoting that within the, the media, both in French and in English. So I, I think in that sense, as long as Mario Cicini is still allowed to do his thing, and obviously he's got a media background, so I think he maybe can finesse things a little bit better, like at least say things not quite so bluntly. And maybe that's really what it was, was just the fact that, again, Gary Gary Stern, he, he wears his heart on his sleeve. What you see is what you get with him. Like he, there's no airs about him. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying there are about Mario Cicini, but I, I think Mario kind of knows, okay, there's a camera on me. Someone's listening to me. You know, there's a microphone in my face. I got to really be careful with what I say and how I say it. And I think that's where Mario shines more than anywhere else is that he knows how to talk to people when they ask him questions like this and answer in a way that doesn't come across as brash or boisterous or incendiary. And whether it's in English or French, he says what he feels. He, he gets his point across and does it in a uh, a more refined way. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and they did a good job. I'm going to give props to the uh, to the PR team and to Mario for how they handled the the Mario uh, to handle the uh, Gary Stern thing. Where yes, if you go and you watch the press con- the the, the, pre- the post game presser um, that's on YouTube that the team put out. Um, most of the, yes, and most of the questions did come and answers came from the the French media. But I'm going to also give them props because I don't know if any more questions were asked by the the English media, by Herb and by you know CTV and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, props to Mario for actually looking and speaking to the camera and explaining the situation with Gary in English, because it because for those who are, are from across the country, they they may want to know and you know they may may want to hear some information about what happened and he was able to give it. So yes, I, I agree with you on that, Cliff that um, Mario has done a good job when it comes to um, updating fans when it comes to issues or concerns within the team itself. So mm-hmm. speaking of <laughs> Mario had nothing to do with this one. Um, do we know that for a fact? I'm I will kidding. say, I will say that with 100% certainty <laughs> that I'd say I'm, I'm saying it with tongue completely planted in cheek. <laughs> yes. And you know what? Considering that you were the one who saw this first, I'm going to let you start with this one because I did not see the same thing until this morning. And then my day spiraled. <laughs> I'm dead serious. My day spiraled. I was, I was, yeah, I should have been working a way lot, a way lot more today than I was. <laughs> so. Well, uh, for the second time this year, uh, my being a night owl, combined with uh, the Twitter feed of one Farhan Laji from TSN out on the West Coast, combined to uh, drop uh, another massive bomb, uh, a Laji bomb, if you will. <laughs> uh, as I was scrolling through Twitter, as Hashtag I was uh, that. you got you got to you got to uh, make you got to make sure Laji bomb that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so. Uh, as I was getting getting ready to hit the hay, I take one more uh, spin around the old uh, Twitter sphere, and uh, lo and behold, uh, Farhan Lalji just drops the news that uh, do not be surprised if Vernon Adams Jr. is traded to the BC Lions, and it could come as early as uh, Wednesday, August thirty first. Potential report would be for a first round draft pick, but uh, this is all still very much in the air. But don't be surprised if this becomes a possibility. So I'm looking, I'm like. Okay, yeah, this, I, I can truly say I'm not surprised. Uh, I mean, it doesn't hide the fact that I'm disappointed by it, but I, I think with the way things have been going this season, I mean, I'll go so far as to say it feels like the Alouettes are just conditioning us for disappointment and how to handle it properly. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, letting Kahari Jones go, letting Baron Miles go, uh, the decision to go with Trevor Harris's quarterback versus Vernon Adams, and now all of it capitulating towards that. Yes, uh, it was officially official today that Vernon Adams was traded to the BC Lions in exchange for, incredibly, mm. their first round draft pick in the 2023 CFL draft. 
And Which is what we funny. talked about, by the way. Heading back to the rumor before, before Vernon got, you know, was out on the sixth game with the tendonitis and before he got COVID, or just after he got COVID? Just after. Yeah. That's what we, isn't that what we stated? That if well, it were to occur, that it should at least, it, uh, uh, you, uh, at least either the multiple picks or at least a first rounder should be involved. I felt three first round draft picks would be a very reasonable ask. And I say this because, well, I mean, <laughs> if Johnny Manziel can command two first round draft picks and he was mediocre at best as a CFL quarterback, uh, Vernon Adams, who has proven himself to be a winner time and time again. In fact, I believe since Anthony Calvillo's retirement, he is the winningest quarterback in Montreal Alouette's history. Like from if you, go, if you look between 2013 to today, he has the best winning record of all. And believe me, there are several Alouette's quarterbacks. He is number one on that list. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I felt, OK, yeah, if you're going to trade Vernon Adams, I don't agree with it. But if you're going to trade for him. You got to get your money's worth out of the guy. I mean, you can't, you can't trade him for, uh, you know, a, a sack of deflated footballs or a, a kicking net. I mean, you got you got to get some player value out to of this be guy. named later. Right. Which, well, I mean, when you think about it, though, a draft pick is kind of a player to be named later. <laughs> it's true. But we had the, But in, as you know, you have the choice of who you're going to choose rather than before you. I don't think when if, when some is the player to be named later, you, you I don't know how much say you have. It It's pretty limited I, I, in my in my experiences. So, yes. And it kind of comes full circle when you think about it, folks, because let's not forget back in 2016, it was one Jim Pop who went to the BC Lions and offered his first round draft pick in exchange for the rights to Vernon Adams because mm-hmm. he was on BC's negotiation list all throughout college. They knew, like, uh, and I'm pretty sure they felt, okay, this is someone that could be a, a superstar in this league. And Jim Pop felt likewise and was willing to make the deal. And at the time, a lot of people kind of gave him the gears for it. Like, wow, you're, tra- you're trading a first round draft pick for some college guy who wasn't good enough to make it to the NFL, which again, I still can't believe that Vernon Adams never got a sniff at the NFL. Anyways, Sure enough, Vernon Adams comes to to training camp and the rest, as they say, is history. So now the fact that he's being dealt back, so to speak, to the to the BC Lions. I know. Six years later. Yeah. Six years. Lots of games. uh, Quite the story. When you think about you, when you think about his story as a CFL quarterback, it really is incredible. But for him to go back now to the BC Lions and the Alouettes get a first round draft pick next year, that's I, I suppose all things considered. That actually is a pretty good haul. I mean, I would have liked two first round, maybe two first round draft picks, but mm. you know, like let's let's not forget, like the BC Lions are in a very precarious spot. Like they're a very good football team. They just lost their superstar quarterback for the year, essentially. I mean, there's talk that oh, he might be able to come back for the playoffs and all that, but no, no, I I think they're pretty. I have a feeling that BC thinks that okay, no, we 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 don't have Nathan Rourke. We we can, we can forget about him. Look at the quarterback room that we have now. You've got Michael O'Connor, another good young Canadian quarterback. You've got Antonio Pipkin, I was about to former say. Alouette, <laughs> who who BA took the starting job from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and controversy, could, quarterback controversy, maybe in BC, maybe maybe. Well, I guess we'll see because yeah, as it stands, well, until today, that was basically the quarterback room was. Uh, uh, Michael O'Connor and Antonio Pipkin. I think there's a third quarterback as well, but I mean, like that's for for a team like the BC Lions, who are eight and two now, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're very much in the playoff hunt. They they are one of still one of the top tier teams in the league in the West of of all places mm-hmm. too. I mean, like like they're a very 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 good football team. They were a very very good football team with Nathan Rourke. Without him. Uh, I guess they, maybe they're they're a little worried about uh, how things are, so they they made the move. They 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 went and they got their own insurance policy in acquiring Vernon Adams because now you're getting someone who we know is a winner, someone who we know is going to be given free reign. I mean, the the OC in uh, in BC has just done magical things with uh, Nathan Rourke, and I imagine that it will not change very much, if at all, with Vernon Adams at the helm and. Trust me, folks, I, I don't think it'll be very long until you see Vernon Adams as the starting quarterback out in B.C. 
I mean, first game back uh, for or first game back for the Lions because they're on a bye this week is next Friday versus <laughs> the Montreal Alouettes. I know. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> I know. By the I, way, quick quick note. Speaking of VA. And I, I don't remember how many of you remembered that VA was was picked up for a first round draft pick from BC back in 2016. Um, by the way, not only do they get a, they get you know the Alouettes got a good a good um, uh, you know good guy off the neg list who wasn't proven. They got a proven quarterback. You know they got, they got a better quarterback back this time around. But I think what's funny though is that with with this occurring. Uh, Vernon Adams, he actually, Cliffy, becomes the first player in league history to be acquired twice for a first-round draft pick. That's remarkable. I mean, only in the CFL, potentially only in the CFL, but yeah, 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 yeah. Just now, one of those weird, wacky things about this crazy league of ours. Right. And I will admit, you know, I know some people could easily go off on social media and stuff like that when they first hear certain things. I mean, and, and, and I've been I've been guilty of just going off, but I think over the years, that since I've been on Twitter and being de- you know dealing with the media a little bit more than I have, I just, I, it's not that I have I've tempered myself. I think I'm just able to get my point across without dropping you know f profanity, yeah, profanity and f bombs and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. um, I, it, there's no secret that. We have, and I know we've mentioned this before, so please bear with us for saying it again. But, you know, we having, I, I guess we could say, having a friend get traded and considering how, in my opinion, that from the beginning of 2020, after Trevor Harris was re-signed. 2022. Sorry, 2022. Mm-hmm. VA never was given a fair shot to regain his starting the starting position. But, you know, oh, but Tim, he started da-da-da. Yes, but there was always, it seemed to be there always was that inkling, that talk, that rumors, you know, because you had two high-priced quarterbacks on the roster. You had a guy who was called not a Danny Machocha guy because he was brought on, really bo- brought on by Coach Kahari Jones. Mm-hmm. And... Ever since, you know, this has been a year of dom, you know, dominoes falling, Cliff. It really has. Yep. Because it, it started off with Trevor being re-signed. And, and I will admit, my views toward Trevor Harris have changed slightly. Because he is currently our starting quarterback. The, he is the team's starting quarterback. But then you have the firing of Baron Miles and Kahari Jones. The taking over with Danny Mack as the head coach. And he's also the GM. I, I just... You know, as I wrote on social media, and I'm going to stand by it. I'm a man who will stand by what I write on social. I just feel from day one, Cliff, that VA was done dirty from day, as I said, from day one in 2022. I think you know there were there are some people to blame for this. You know, there are rumors that came out, and we really can't believe them because I know in today's press conference uh, in French, um, Danny Mac was asked about the comment that was put on by TSN by Farhad Nalji. You know that. Gary Stern stopped the trade or a potential trade for VA of VA or previous trade attempts. Yes. Yes. Um, and because Gary is gone now that basically gave him the green light. Now there's, there's, there's no, there's no proof to that. You know, Danny Mac did say, talk to TSN. He basically pushed it, pushed aside what was said. Um, whether that's the case or not, we don't know whether, uh, you know, uh, we are just reading that there are, it doesn't look like there was any interference by the, uh, you know, by the majority ownership of the team. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, this has been a year where it seems that you know certain people tied to this team prior to 2019 were always going to be, you know, we're always going to be in the, you know, in the crosshairs, and that's what's happened. Yes. As I said, it's been domino after domino after domino after domino, mm-hmm. and finally VA was traded. Now, I, I've I've said. You know, that I, I said on social, I said in my 25 years as being a season ticket holder, that I, at, when I wrote this, I've never been, I've never been as disappointed in the Alouettes franchise and football ops as I am right now. And I think it stems, my, that thought and process and feelings stem back to Cliff, again, as I mentioned before, what has happened in 2022 and how for certain situations it has just been an entire, it's just been a cluster. 
It has because you you look at how this year started with you know Vernon was named he was the guy he was the guy mm-hmm. goes about changing his number because as everybody knows and I, I I agree with him number three was his number which is funny would change you know change the scenery it's completely changed now curious what he'll get in BC um, <laughs> but a change in number the team had an opportunity to be able to change his you know for fans to be and teams do not allow fans to change their jersey because their superstar quarterback changes his number. You know, they allow them to do this. They won't do this with Joe Player. Nope. You know, it just seemed like everything that, it, great idea by the, you know, by the marketing department. But it just, after everything this year, it just fell flat. You know, VA in the uh, merchandise photo shoots. Um, you know, I, it, it's Fe- just featured gone. in all kinds of vignettes. Yeah, it's just uh, him going to uh, yeah him going to Quebec City with Joey Alfieri. It, it's just again, I, I'm trying to separate myself from being a fan and being from part of the media. It's just a matter of I just I just everything went wrong this year. It, you go back and you look at these things, and it you don't do this to your superstar quarterback. You don't pull him after going two for four for 18 yards. Trevor has happened, the same thing has happened to Trevor, and it was allowed to stay in. They didn't change him for Dominic Davis. Nope. He was allowed to make mistakes. He was allowed to make mistakes. Uh, like it, He was allowed to make errors and didn't lose his job as a result. No. Again, it was, I think it was just from day one in 2022. It was, gonna, it was inevitable. It was going to be inevitable. Well, yeah. I, I will say it, with 100% certainty, with, with BC coming to town next week, I will be rocking my VA jersey. Because I may not, I don't think we'll be able to see VA before he leaves. I know we've talked to him, but it'll, it'll be my way to say thank you to VA. Definitely. As a fan. I'm happy for him where he's going. Hopefully he'll get the chance. I want him to ball out. But I just, I, I just, just a bad taste in my mouth and how this occurred and how this thing has just grown all season. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you didn't, you, you spoke out quite, quite a bit on social too. And I'm curious to know your thoughts because this just isn't just all about me yapping here. But, <laughs> but, but, but it, I, I want to I know what you feel. Well, again, I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed. I mean, I really did and still do feel that Vernon Adams is your best bet as far as a quarterback goes. Like, he is that guy that will lead a team if given the opportunity to shine. At, with the right in the right environment, he can take a team to the promised land. I've always believed that. I believed it back in 2016 after watching him play. In 2022, I believed, okay, this was as good a chance as any to be able to do that. Uh, I still think back to 2019, how he put this team on his back, win or lose, and made for very exciting football to be watched in Montreal. And to see, like, this is basically, you know, this this is how the story ends. At least the Montreal chapter, this is how it ends, is disappointing. I guess uh, I've been so conditioned to this team and some of their decisions that I can't say I'm mad. I'm just, I guess, as I said, disappointed, obviously, because, yes, uh, you and I, we, we've known Vernon for a long time. We've gotten very close to him. And, you know, he definitely was a part of us as much as we. I like to think we were a part of him. And I, I, I'm just, you know, I, I obviously want, I want the best for him. There's no question about that. I have no, BC got so much better as a result of today's trade. There's no question about that. No disrespect to Michael O'Connor or Antonio Pipkin, but with Nathan Rourke going down to injury, this was the best thing that the BC Lions could do for themselves to maintain what they have going on right now in the CFL West. Adding VA to the lineup improve well yeah it improves them quite frankly i mean like they didn't take necessarily a step back but this team i think will get itself righted again with him at the helm as far as i'm concerned like this is a move they absolutely had to make and kudos to them for pulling it off danny machoch has made it made it very clear that he's a trevor harris guy and as long as the alouettes keep winning i think most fans are going to be happy and are going to be content and will go along with it but I think a lot of fans, too, are going to be disappointed because they believed in VA. They believed in everything he did. They remember that uh, magical 2019 season and felt like if given the chance, he could have done that again. He was close to doing it last year until he got hurt. He was, I think he was starting to find his stride again. He was kind of Jekyll and Hyde for the most 
for most of the the summer. But I mean, I think he was starting to find his form again, and then he got hurt and ended up losing out. Like he was gone for the rest of the season. We thought, okay, 2022, this is going to be a year of redemption. He's back. He's healthy. He's taken all the steps. He's doing everything that we expect Vernon Adams to do to become that guy again. And the first game in Calgary, he looked kind of like the Vernon Adams that we, we've come to know as flashy at times, makes the occasional mistake, uh, but puts his team in, in, in an opportunity to be able to win a game and came very close to doing so. Didn't work out. No, but he was also overshadowed by... Losing Greg Reed, who still isn't back, and losing uh, William William Standback, and and so on and so forth. There was there was a there was a lot of circumstances to it, and also to once Vernon's biggest proponent was Kahari Jones. Once he lost that, you kind of got the impression that the writing, like you saw the writing on the wall, that okay, it's obvious that Danny Machocha wants to run this team a certain way, and it doesn't involve Kahari Jones or any of the people that Kahari Jones has hired as coach, and doesn't involve anyone that Kahari Jones thought could be the quarterback because a lot of the playbook, a lot of what Kahari had done was designed with VA in mind and not necessarily Trevor Harris. Whereas now uh, with Danny Mac as the head coach and Anthony Calvillo calling the plays and tailoring everything more towards the style of play that Trevor Harris is accustomed to, they, they just basically became no place for VA anymore. So now you've put him on the six game list uh, as injured and yes he did have some injury issues but looks to be fine looks like he's ready to go i mean he's been looking ready to go for a while it's just now a matter of when's he going to get that opportunity and now he's, he's going to get his opportunity it just won't be as a montreal alouette and now you're left with the question of okay well you've you've you, you put all your eggs in the trevor harris basket okay fine that's your prerogative what happens if trevor harris gets hurt mm-hmm now you have Dominique Davis, who has done a good job as a short yardage quarterback, but we still haven't seen enough of him at regular quarterback. And what we have seen hasn't been, I'll be honest, too fantastic. Maybe it's because a lack of opportunity. I don't know, but we haven't seen too much there. Uh, Davis Alexander, who we've been very high on since seeing him in training camp, kind of like how we were in 2016 when we saw a certain Vernon Adams in training camp. Yeah, I thought oh, damn, this guy's got potential. All he just needs is the opportunity. We kind of feel the same way about Davis Alexander right now is we were very impressed with what we saw him in training camp, and now we're just hoping that he'll have the opportunity. Does this move mean that potentially he'll get that opportunity? I guess only time will tell. I, I don't know if there's a plan to sort of integrate him a little bit more into the games now knowing that he is still very much a quarterback for the Montreal Alouettes. I guess only time will tell, or do we have to wait and see if Trevor Harris gets hurt before you throw him into the fire and hope for the best? In which case, this is the this is what you've set up yourself for now, is you got no more VA, no more Kahari Jones, no more Baron Miles, no more any of uh, you know any of the remnants, if you will, of the, I'll even go so far as to say the Cavus Reed era, because a lot of these coaches and a lot of these hires were directly or indirectly done by Cavus Reed. So it, it really feels like you just wanted to flush that era out as much as possible. And unfortunately, I mean, I'll admit, I'll admit that I, I wasn't too keen on that era anyways. <laughs> right. But let's not forget, it was Cavus Reed that brought Vernon Adams back. Yes. It was also Cavus Reed that traded him to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. But that's again, let's let's not go there. It was Cavus Reed that hired Kahari Jones. It was Cavis Reed that brought in a lot of the, like, you know, a lot of this came as a result of Cavis Reed and then ultimately Kahari Jones. So now that's the old regime that you want to flush out and you want to put your own stamp on it. And again, as the general manager and now head coach, Denny Machocha has the right to do that as he sees fit. And he's taking full advantage of that. So more power to him. But now ha- now you have to ask yourself, OK, if VA is not the future, who is the future? Because I'm sorry, Trevor Harris is. I, I don't think he's turned 37 yet, but I mean, he's he's at least 36 now, if not yeah. 37. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to say, unless you're Tom Brady, quarterbacks do not get better with age. Yes, Trevor Harris has been playing decent football as of late, but sooner or later, everybody, everybody tails off as they get older. So, I mean, it's great now. Like Trevor's, Trevor does have a winning streak going, so I'll, you know, kudos to him for that. But when you think about the long-term future of the Alouettes, Who's your quarterback? And I'll tell you what, Tim, I was thinking about this a lot today. Like, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in and among the disappointment and everything with VA going, 
I can't help but think, okay, what's the long-term plan for the Alouettes? What is their end game when it comes to the quarterback position? Because I'm sure even Danny Machocha realizes, okay, Trevor Harris, yeah, he's my guy, but he's not going to be around forever. Whether it's, God forbid, he gets injured or just simple fact, as I said, quarterback 30 plus, they they don't appreciate in value. They depreciate. So what's the future going to hold? And I can't help but wonder, Tim, now that the Yellowettes have two first round picks in next year's draft, mm-hmm. how, however the Yellowettes finish and however the BC Lions finish, I got a feeling both teams, believe it or not, are still going to finish fairly. They're going to end up doing fairly well. They're not going to get the first over. Neither team is going to fall bad enough to get the first overall pick. I just right. don't see that happening. Right. But you got two picks. You've got, once again, two picks. And you saw what Danny Machocha did this year with two first round picks. Yes. He, I, I think he, he he made out like a bandit, as far as I'm concerned, in getting Tyrell Richards and Tyson Philpot. Can he replicate that again next year? And I was like, okay. There is a quarterback in the RSEQ mm-hmm. that is getting a lot of buzz for the Heck Crichton Award, which right. for our American listeners, that's basically the Canadian version of the Heisman Trophy for the best football player in the country. A young quarterback named Jonathan Senecal, who has played extremely well for, are you ready for this? UDM. <laughs> yep. The Montreal Caravan. Which, I, which by the way. Saw him this weekend. If anybody watched the the TVA game, it was the home opener for the Concordia Stingers, and it was and it was uh, the UDM. So yeah, he was on TV. Yeah. So continue. I'm sorry. This kid is getting a lot of buzz, and I would not be surprised at all if right now Trevor Harris, he's the man, he's the guy for for Danny Machocha for this season, 100. percent Come next year, though. Depending on how the season goes, whether Yellowwitz win it all or lose it all or what have you, you still got to deal with this notion that, okay, you've got a quarterback who is closer to his 40s than his 30s. How are you going to like what, what's going to be the the next generation, so to speak? Who better to take with one of your first round draft picks than this young hotshot quarterback who is a Montreal or a Quebec native played for the Université de Montréal? Was coached by Anthony Calvillo before he he left for the Alouettes, mm-hmm. who knows this quarterback pretty well. And this quarterback has even said the teachings of one Anthony Calvillo has really helped his game. And let's not forget, folks, all the rage right now are, are these young, hotshot Canadian quarterbacks. Nathan Rourke, you've seen what he's done this year. Mm-hmm. I can't help but wonder if Danny Mack is thinking to himself, I wonder if Jonathan Senecal is the next Nathan Rourke. Don't forget I've Trey been, Ford. Don't forget Trey Ford. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, like I said, but again, this is this is the idea is that this notion that a, a, a young Canadian quarterback could come in and light the league up, like what Nathan Rourke did. I can't help but wonder if Danny Mac is thinking Jonathan Senecal could be his Nathan Rourke. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you draft him, you bring him in. You know, you've got AC there as the coach, and you know whatever happens with Trevor Harris happens with Trevor. You know, whatever happens happens. But you you draft this guy, you bring him along, you have the coach that worked has worked with him in the past, and maybe that's what he, maybe that's how he feels the future of this team at quarterback is is with Jonathan Senecal versus Vernon Adams. So interesting I mean, to me. I, I'm just saying I'm not saying it's going to happen, folks. But but it's been set up now with ha- with the Owls having two first round draft picks, having two first round draft picks, having what you know uh, so many elements of the car- the former Montreal Caribbean here in Montreal with the Alouettes, up to and including Danny Machocha as head coach and GM. I mean, once again, I, like sometimes the stars just align a certain way, and I can't help but wonder if that's the ultimate, like the long game, if you will, for, mm-hmm. for this organization, is to put themselves in a position to be able to go out and get this kid and bring him in and make him the next Nathan Rourke, if you will. Where's he... Because I don't, I don't know if the, the scouting reports that are, I don't know how many times a year the scouting reports are put out. Has there been one recently, and is is he on the the, uh, the Canadian scouting report? Uh, it hasn't been published yet. I think it comes out in mid September. Okay. But uh, again, there, there has definitely been a lot of hype around him. As far as I said, the the Heck Crichton Award, like for him to be in that conversation, tells me he's doing something right. And uh, like it's it's not something you just throw around and. I've actually gone and checked out some clips of him on YouTube. Like so, the kid can sling a football. Well, that He's, last week's game versus Concordia, I think he had three TDs. I, I mean, again, there's talent. Like, the, and this is a young quarterback that 
if you have a chance to develop someone like that, and again, this is just the perfect scenario for Danny Machocha. You know what, how how he's been as far as like when it comes to the draft, when it comes to free agency, when it comes to bringing in players from Quebec to play for the Alouettes. You know that's been from the day, from the day he was hired. He said has said that he, that was a a focus, a, a goal of his was to make this team as Quebecois as possible and. You, you think to yourself, well, you can't do that at quarterback. I'm like, well, you just need the right quarterback to come along. And, I mean, if, if things keep progressing the way he has, I mean, Jonathan Senecal, that that could very well be what Danny Machoch is thinking as far as the future for the Montreal Alouettes at quarterback. It would be interesting because it really seems, you know, Canadian quarterbacks have re- successful Canadian quarterbacks in the CFL have, you know, the track record is you know, it's it's here, it's here, and there. It's not, you know, it's not really there. But but just in the past two years alone, something about the who are willing to come play in the CFL. I mean, to you know, for for Edmonton to pull off the coup to get Trey Ford to come play in the CFL. You know, sure he started off as a wide receiver, but he had a little bit of time of at quarterback too, and. You know, Nathan worked too because you know there's talk about with how well he was playing. Was he going to be you know picked up by the uh, you know, by by the NFL, you know, maybe that was a thought too. You know, for, by BC to bring in to bring in in VA. I mean, but I think works in a, aren't they? I think Danny Mac mentioned today is uh, isn't it three year contracts for rookies? Could be, but also too, don't forget the NFL window is open pretty much any time. I thought that was only in their last year of their contract or in their option year. Uh, uh, no, it's is it's it, been amended now that pretty much any time you want to explore the NFL window, you can. Okay. Okay, you may you may but, be on you may be onto something, Cliff, because I didn't you and I had not talked about that before. You know, during our our, our pregame, uh, pre-show meeting, it, it's an interesting thought. It really, really is, and I want again. I wonder if Danny Mac had that in his head, and obviously he doesn't want to show his cards mm-hmm. because if that's the case, and he may have to fight or possibly trade again, trade up to get this spot potentially. Which, considering what he did last year. I wouldn't put it past him to do it again. No, and if, uh, I mean, as it stands right now, you're looking at uh, Edmonton and Ottawa are currently the basement dwellers, if you will, of the, the Canadian Football League. I, I mean, if it, if it stays that way, then that's who Dynamax going to have to go for. If if the other teams, too, believe that uh, Jonathan Senecal can be that guy, then at least it, now you've got not one, but two aces in the hole as far as being able to try and if that if that's your goal, if that's your if that's the the player whose services you want to land for your team, then these are the moves you you may have to make. At least you've got those cards to offer, so to speak. If you want to be ensure if you want to ensure that you get in a position to draft the guy you want, then hey, you've got that yeah. up your sleeve. Just an, just another reason now, just another reason for Alouette fans to watch these lists that, that are put out by the uh, by the uh, scouting board. Just another reason to watch. Another, it, another, now, reason, another reason to watch RSEQ football. Exactly. I mean, like we, we, we talked about this, folks. I mean, like there are a lot of really good Canadian born players. And now more and more of them are going to the NCAA. But U Sports still has themselves some pretty good players. And the RSEQ is no exception, especially with Laval and uh, University de Montreal. Like they have definitely been uh, football powerhouses for the better part of almost two decades now. So. If the next great quarterback is going to come from U Sports, could that be? Only time's going to tell. But I mean, <laughs> the way the way things are looking right now, I, I truly will not be surprised if this is how it all plays out. When it's all said and done, the following scenario that I just painted for you folks, I truly think that's where things are going. If, if I were to, if I was a bet, well, I am a betting man, but I mean, I'm not willing to bet, you know, my my house or my car or anything like that. But I mean, I'm I'm fairly, I feel fairly confident. That's the direction where this team is going, and I think that's the end game right now. Is for the scenario that I just painted for you folks. I, I just don't see anything else based on today's trade, based on the return, based on everything that's kind of surrounding the team as it sits right now. I truly believe that's what this team is looking to do for 2023. Wow, um, we're not we're not closing the saga on VA. Um, he is welcome back on the show anytime to talk about his football career. Um, I know Cliffy puts a nice uh, thank you out on Instagram on our, over on our Instagram 
But I, I will say that, um, you know, again, as I said, it's all the best to VA. I hope he does amazing, except when he plays, you know, he can do amazing, but just, you know, not amazing enough to, to beat the Alouettes. <laughs> um, but uh, VA, um, uh, it, this isn't goodbye. It's just we'll see you later, bud. What we'll is see you later? What her percent. And yeah, what, as Tim said, he he's definitely our guy. He's. We we remain his day one guys, and we will always be his day one guys. We will always believe in him as not just a quarterback, at, but as a human being as well. I mean, as I said, as good as great as he's been on the field, he's ten times better off of it. A lot of people I mean, said that too. Yeah, he's just off the. You guys in BC embrace him, embrace him. And you know what? He's going to embrace you as well, and that's that's the thing. He's going to show up and show out for for the BC Lions. You can bank on that. Yeah. It sucks to have lost Nathan Rourke essentially for the year, and uh, again, who who knows what's going to happen between this injury and the NFL possibly calling? Who knows what's going to happen? But you know what? Now you've got yourselves straightened out, as far as I'm concerned. Like I think your quarterback situation is settled now. VA is going to be that guy that you need right now. Mm-hmm. Um, before we go to the matchup for this week's game coming off the bye week versus the Ottawa. Red Blacks, which is a very, it still is. This Again, we've mentioned, I think, last week that this is a huge series at home for the Alouettes where they need to win as many games as possible. Um, we need to talk about something that we don't know much about it, but it, it's already been dealt, you know, it's been dealt with, but at least we have to mention it, Cliff. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not good to see a player get in trouble with the law for whatever the reason may be, because it's happened before here in Montreal, it's happened before in the CFL, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the Alouettes announced the situation with Christophe Normand and uh, suspended until further notice for certain things. And the team, rightly so, released him today. Uh, the team did put out a statement talking about about what he did and you know, obviously I, I understand the why they did what they did um you know he was just, he was suspended originally pending his accus- accusations of luring um but they did release him and I, I just really I don't think any much more that we can say but I mean it's it, it's a tough subject you know my only thought is of those fans whether you know no matter where his fans are located uh, and what age group, how they will perceive him now. Because, you know, if your hero were to do something, I guess a great analogy is if you happen to watch the series of the boys on prime, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because it's, you never think of superheroes in that light or think of superheroes being able to do what they do. If you haven't seen the boys go watch an episode, you understand what I mean. And if you do watch it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I, I just hope, I just hope, I hope that his, his, I hope the fans of his understand. I, and if not, I hope they are, exp- it is explained to them what has been done and why it should never occur. I, I don't know where else to go with this, Cliff. I don't know if you have anything to say, but. That- well, it's, like I said, the, when the police are involved and uh, it, it, it's a very, delicate uncomfortable situation that uh, that the team and himself are in and i think the team had no choice really but to uh, cut all ties and mm-hmm. you know they I, I think they wanted to do their due diligence they wanted to make sure they got as much information as possible because it was kind of well sprung on everybody really when you think about it and then especially during the bye week too when everybody's away from the team so you're everybody's kind of caught with their pants down when you're you're hit with a bombshell like this but uh, when, when when the authorities are involved, uh, yeah, that kind of makes thing that, that kind of bumps things up uh, tremendously. So, uh, I mean, the Elwets made it official that they were releasing him, mm-hmm. uh, I, and I guess the courts will decide what what will come of what he's done, his transgressions. But uh, you know, we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, I think uh, you know it, it's unfortunate. It's uh, something that I don't think reflects on the team at all. I think they were dealt. This, I think this came completely out of left field. They didn't know how to, how, how you know, there's there's no handbook to explain how to handle such a situation. But they, well, I think they wanted to get as much information as possible, and at that point make a 
rational decision. And I, I think truly the only thing you could do at that point was to release him and the courts will decide what's going to happen as far as uh, what he's been charged for. And mm-hmm. we'll just we'll just leave it at that. Uh, we move forward and uh, Lord knows there's all kinds of news going on that I guess this kind of gets pushed to the back burner. And I guess, we'll, you know, it's true. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I mean, that's I think that's all the attention I really, truly want to give on this I agree. on this matter. I agree. Uh, and in a very busy day for the Alouettes, which something which was actually announced prior to the VA trade, the Alouettes themselves, Cliff, made an, uh, another trade today, didn't they? Yeah, kind of got overshadowed just a little bit. Just a tad. Just a tad. <laughs> And who who better to make a deal with than your old buddies over at the Edmonton Elks? <laughs> I know for the umpteenth time in the last eighteen months. Oh my gosh! Like I, I like I, I, whatever happens this year with the Alouettes, whether they win the Grey Cup or go to the Grey Cup or flame out, who who knows? But I mean. My gosh, I hope Danny Matocha really sends Chris Jones a nice fruit basket or some sort of thank you gift because they got Chris Jones on retainer. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's not to be like uh, because my goodness, like let's not forget, folks. Earlier this year, a- as we've stated, Danny Matocha swung a heck of a deal to get the first overall draft pick, uh, enabling him to select Tyrell Richards. Not content with that, he makes a deal with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in order to move up, take over the. The, the ninth spot by the, the Winnipeg Blue Bears, allowing him to draft Tyson Philpott. These are two young players who have already made an impact this year for the Montreal Alouettes in different ways, but they have both made their own impact on this team and not giving up a whole lot when you think about it. I, I mean, the negotiation list player that the Alouettes traded to Edmonton was in the NFL, planned to stay in the NFL, and then got hurt, essentially ending his season. So he's not coming up north anytime soon. So I, I can't help but feel if Jonesy must wonder him, like he kind of got fleeced a little bit with this deal. And if that wasn't enough, sure enough, his old buddy Danny Mack calls up and uh, they, they swing another deal. Uh, how it breaks down is this. The Alouettes are sending defensive lineman Avery Ellis and a third round draft pick in the 2023 UCFL draft to the Elks in exchange for... Defensive back Nafis Lyon and defensive lineman Thomas Costigan. Now, folks, <laughs> once again, call the police because Danny Mac just committed another robbery. <laughs> uh, Nafis Lyons has really stood out. Uh, he, he has made some tremendous plays for the Elks over the past two years, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Costigan, too, has just been one of those solid players that just will make a very good defensive line, even better. I mean, Avery Ellis has done a, a very solid job this year for the Alouettes, but oh my gosh, I mean, th- this is this is a great, great deal. And to the point where you're asking yourself, okay, Danny Mack must have something on Chris Jones to be able to make not one, but two <laughs> tremendous deals. Like the, the, both of these deals severely favor the Alouettes. I mean, they are, again, making out like a bandit. I, 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 I you can't even be mad. I mean, like as mad as you might be about him trading Vernon Adams, like you look at this deal, and like if if this deal just didn't happen to be made the same day that VA gets traded, you're looking at yourself like, holy crap, this is great. Like we are getting more defensive back help, which this team, I, I, I think the Elwoods now over the past couple of games, starting to find their form in 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 secondary, but still could use just a little bit more help. And the Feast Lions is going to provide that. Mm-hmm. This defensive line, I, I mean, I've been singing their praises all year. Like, I really, truly think this defensive line has been outstanding for the Alouettes. And that was including Avery Ellis. Like, he has done a very, very solid job every time he stepped onto the field. So if Thomas Costigan can come in and it basically be like, you know, a one-for-one one trade in that regards, that's great. But to get a Nafis line as well, and all it cost you was a third-round draft pick, I mean, you're laughing. Like, this is outstanding. Like, the... These are the kind of moves you want your general manager to make. So, I mean, listen, say what you will about Danny Mac, but when it comes to making deals with the Elks, for the most part, he does a pretty good job getting uh, maximum value out of uh, whoever it is he trades. He manages to get maximum value in return. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, it's, you know, first I hear about the trade and I was like, oh my God, again with the Everton Elks? But you can't argue with your logic there, Cliff, in any way, shape, or form, because... If these guys can make a, obviously they won't play this week. 
I, yeah. I don't think there's. I, and I say, you know, they they won't. There's no way. I think I think Danny Mac mentioned that in the press conference today and in the post practice scrum, which obviously it makes sense because they. I mean, may, maybe the surprises. Well, what we'll when the. I don't think they will, but it, hey, check for the uh, dr- um, for the depth charts. There may be there may be a surprise, but you never know. Um, uh, I mean, put it this way: when Derek Dennis tweets out like, the emoji, the eyeball emojis, like the big eyes, like the saucer eyes, like mm-hmm. the what mm-hmm. kind of reaction, mm-hmm. you know, you've done good. Either or, unless you're Edmonton, then you've done bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So. Uh, Again, I mean, th- this is one of those moves that, like most, like I said, I'm sure a lot of fans right now they're pissed off or disappointed or whatever about BVA being traded. Like I said, if you made this trade, this trade, the this Elks trade, if you made this trade yesterday, you're you're celebrating, you're 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 ecstatic, like wow, we j- wow, just like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, as I said, with the news of VA being traded, it a trade like this, a trade like this is just kind of gonna get. I won't say necessarily swept under the rug, but you're almost like, oh, yeah, uh, okay. And you may not see it now, but the next couple of weeks, when these guys get into the lineup and get playing, you're going to notice, folks. And I think you're going to be very, very pleased with this move. You may not be pleased with the VA move. I know we aren't. We're not, we're not terribly thrilled about it right now. But uh, I think uh, when it comes to this uh, this trade that we made with the Edmonton Elks, Alouettes fans, I think you're going to be very, very happy with these moves. Yeah. And also in a strange situation, uh, we don't know the full story behind this, but it's, it's as if Tavian Feaster didn't report back to the team or something. We, I, I think we I, it may either mentioned we either on one of the stories online for TSN or Herb mentioned it, but the Owls also announced that they released running back Tavian Feaster. So, but I mean, the, the, the one of the pluses is that I think we heard it was it was mentioned. I think Danny Mac mentioned that it's very possible that. And I think we saw a video of it of Stanbeck being quote unquote back on the field, and I think they said October. They were looking maybe even like late, very late September. Yeah, which I guess essentially is October. But <laughs> yeah, all, all, uh, essentially he'd be back this year, which a lot of people were not expecting him to be back this year. Mm-hmm. Or it would be if if he was going to come back, it would be like for a very late playoff run, right? As in November. So. The, the the just the, the thought of Stanback coming back in late Oct- or late September early October is huge in and of itself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, by the way, thoughts on Samuel Thomason being released? Also, well, I mean, he's kind of been a ghost to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I remember the Alouettes taking him. Uh, I think it was twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen as one of the territorial picks, uh, which are basically picks given to you because you're bad at football mm-hmm. and uh, they let you pick someone close to home uh that's basically what thomason was was uh he was one of those territorial picks uh just whether it was due to health issues or just inability to, to even scratch the lineup he just never seemed to be able to get in there like he dressed for games but uh saw very very limited action yeah. uh, to the point where like i even wondered if he was still on the team like <laughs> i just assumed he'd be injured or on the practice roster and now he's gone. So yeah. um, <laughs> Unfor- it's unfortunate because, again, a Quebec-born player. So, I mean, this this notion that uh, Danny Mac will give all the breaks to the Quebec-born players, well, that's out the window. I mean, at the end of the day, you still got to be able to produce. Right. And for whatever reason, uh, Thomason just never never really got a chance to show what he can do. And when he did, never showed what he could do. So yeah. that's why he's on the outside looking in, unfortunately. By the way, I just thought of something, too, which we didn't bring up before when we were talking about uh, the VA trade in the current state of the team when it comes to quarterbacks. Um, people need to remember too that Davis Alexander was our guy on the practice roster. Mm-hmm. Who are the who are the it, we ha- and we and you know what with VA now being traded, who's who are the Alouettes going to pick up? We need another quarterback, obviously, who will most likely be on the practice roster. Well, let's not forget too the NFL made all of their mm-hmm. training camp cuts, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. And of course, pr- uh, practice rosters will be expanding in the next couple of weeks. So I, I have no doubt in my mind that the scouting staff, uh, they've got to have their eye on a couple of guys. If they don't end up as practice roster guys in the NFL, somehow get them to come up here and be practice roster guys for the Alouettes. True. Unless, unless who else, who else was on our roster in camp? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> had- uh, ben Holmes was also a quarterback, right. but I believe 
he went uh, actually i think if i'm not mistaken he's either with bc or edmonton on their practice roster oh, okay well hey well you know you know the rules when it comes to the practice roster but there's a problem to that if the Alouettes were to were to teef somebody from the practice roster but yeah you gotta you gotta play them you, you gotta act <laughs> or dress them you have to activate them for for the first week is yep. that the first is that what the rule is one week at, at least yeah yeah so i mean the idea is that okay if you're gonna take this guy from us you better use him so. yeah exactly yeah um Alouettes continue their home, their, their 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 home stand, their long home stand by playing the Ottawa Red Blacks this Friday at seven thirty at Percival Molson Stadium. Um, it seems to be a throwback '80s. I think that's what I'm seeing on what to expect from Five Reasons to show up. And then I know it's a it's a beer, uh, it's a Friday night light Friday night beer Friday or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. Um. And I say that, I think they'd be playing '80s music, and that, that would have been the perfect perfect reason to to, to break out a, a an alternate uniform. By the way, um, sure, why not? But thoughts on this: this is a team that played Ottawa, could easily have lost to Ottawa, but there is a kind of a change now in quarterback where it's going to be Arbuckle, most likely behind center for the Red Blacks this week. Mm-hmm. And obviously, this is a very important game for the Alouettes because they want to continue to rise in, you know, they'll improve the record, get to 10 points and to get ever so close, you know, potentially to being the first overall spot in the Eastern Division in the weekend, Eastern, weekend Eastern Division this year. Mm-hmm. What, are your, was- what, are, what are your thoughts on this? And by the way, real quick so people know, and, you know, I, stats that t- Tim Capper keeps. Uh, this is the second time the Alouettes have played the Red Blacks coming off of a bye. Mm-hmm. It happened last year, Cliff. Al's lost. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It happened in it happened in 2019. Sorry, in 2019, and the Al's lost. Yeah. I was during the Cavis Reed uh, behind the bench regime. <laughs> so, thoughts on this game? It's definitely an important game for both teams when you think about it because – I think Ottawa, they did not play the best game ever against the Elks last week, but they did enough to win. And it looked convincing for the most part, to the point where, like, Nick Arbuckle definitely looks like he's, he may have finally found his groove. The, what I, but they speak, speaking of another quarterback that just has been handed a raw deal. You know what? It, it's one of those weird things, because he's bounced from, uh, it's funny, he actually went from, he was traded from Calgary to Ottawa, for the first overall pick back in 2020 uh, ended up, I think he was signed, but then released and he went and ended up going to Toronto. Uh, didn't get a chance to do a whole lot in Toronto because McLeod Bethel Thompson ended up being a lot more of a competent quarterback, got traded to the Elks uh, who proceeded to keep him on the bench for the rest of the 2021 season. Uh, finally got a chance to play a bit this year and really didn't look all that good to the point where people were wondering, like this guy has to be like a flash in the pan. This like, what's the deal with this guy? Like he looks so amazing that first year in Calgary and then has just looked like a dog's breakfast ever since. But I don't know what it is. Like maybe, you know, it takes a while to find your fit, to find your groove. And I know it was just one game, but it looked like Arbuckle finally figured it out and ended up playing a half decent game against the Elks. And I don't know if it's because, the Elks are just as much of a sad sack franchise as what the Red Blacks appear to be. And maybe it was just a battle of, like, who's the best of the worst? <laughs> maybe Ottawa ended up, it turns out it is Ottawa's the best of the worst, and they just look better playing against the Elks. See how they play against Montreal, because Montreal, they've got momentum right now, uh, even though they're on a bye week, and that kind of may have cooled things down a little bit. But uh, Montreal is starting to figure themselves out. They're starting to find their form. Uh, there's, they've, they've got the confidence, uh, I think that they've been missing for the better part of the year. So I think this game is very important for both teams, really, truly, uh, especially too with, uh, Toronto playing Hamilton and Hamilton right now is completely in shambles. Yeah. But it's about, yeah, with Matt, Sch- uh, Matt Schultz going out, he's out yeah. for four to six. Yeah. And Dane Evans has not looked good no. at all. So no, ever since, ever since he was named the starter. <laughs> and, and, and traditionally, Hamilton usually plays this Liberty Classic very well and almost always seems to come away with a W. 
unless like Ricky Ray's your quarterback in in Toronto. But uh, I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised given the state of affairs right now with the Hamilton Tiger Cats that Toronto ends up winning, which means that they ju- they're just going to pad their lead in the CFL East and Montreal. If they want to at least stay toe to toe with the Argonauts, they're going to have to win this game on Friday and Ottawa. They've now got confidence. Now they're starting to feel themselves just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And if they could walk into Montreal and shut everybody up and, and start a winning streak of their own, I mean, that, that changes the game considerably. And even in the, their sad state of affairs, and just because the CFL East is just terrible right now, mm-hmm. I mean, Ottawa is not out of it by any stretch. I mean, if they've truly got it figured out now with their coaching and with our Buckle as quarterback, watch out. I mean, this this has all the makings of a trap game potentially for Montreal. I know, and, and yeah, it's funny we've mentioned this before when it comes to when it comes to Ottawa and trap games, and it, it, it dates back to. And I know I've made reference to it before. It was that Canada Day game back, and was it twenty twelve where they lost in overtime? That's two thousand five, actually. Was it two thousand? You know, I think I made the same mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I think I made the same mistake last time. Some some has some historian you are, Capper. Uh, <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, again, I, I agree. It could easily be a trap game. Easily. And, and let's not forget, folks, I don't want to throw cold water on the Alouettes and their success as of late. But let's not forget. Yeah, they're on a two-game winning streak. But look how they won those two games. Like, they had to fight and scratch to just barely win both of them. Like, I would like to see a more complete effort, a, a, a real convincing win. And one would think, like, initially you would have thought, okay, they're playing the Red Blacks and they're just uh, a, a train wreck of a team. This should be a gimme. But based on what I saw last week against Edmonton, and again, I fully realizing this is Edmonton, and they're just not in much better shape, quite frankly, and especially now that they that they seem to be in fire sale mode, especially with the trade that was made today. I mean, is... Which Ottawa team is going to show up? Is it going to be a half decent team that's going to compete, and the same one that competed almost to the end with Montreal a few weeks ago in Ottawa, or is Montreal going to get their act together and be that dominant team that they feel they should be and that they probably feel they are, and just lay a beating on the Red Blacks? Mm. It considering the season and everything that's happened so far to, for fans and stuff, it, you know, it's been. A, you know, positives as of late, obviously. It would be nice to see the Alouettes just, just run roughshod over the Red Blacks. Um, I, and I think also, too, like, when you think about it, like, the pressure is now on. Like, Trevor Harris doesn't have VA hanging around anymore. Like, now there's no question. This is your team now, Trevor Harris. Like, but you've got to show that you deserve this. And I, I seem to say this every week, but Trevor Harris has to keep proving himself. Like, winning, just winning doesn't isn't going to cut it like now we're at the point like okay we know you can win football games but now we want to see you win football games consistently and convincingly like like you know a win's a win there's no question about it but i would prefer to see this alouette's team win by more than three points Mm -hmm. you know like yes get the win by any means necessary but at the same time if you want people to take you seriously and to think that you're that threat that you seem to think you are then especially against a team like Ottawa, you've got to you got to show that you're dominant. You got to be able to make this a convincing victory. And if you can do that, then you know now you, you're looking at a three game winning streak. You're looking at possibly a share of first place, mm-hmm. depending on what happens on Labor Day. Mm-hmm. Which again, anything can happen on Labor Day. But uh, I think Montreal truly has to get their act together, keep it together, and just prove that they are who they say they are. It, that's really what it comes down to. They've got to prove themselves. And, you know, a lot of people probably say, oh, of course they beat Ottawa. Ottawa's a terrible team. Like, are they a terrible team? Or they just want you to think they're a terrible team and you just take them lightly? Because if you just take these, this team lightly, they'll make you pay. Like, that's really, truly how I, 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 I see it here. You talk about trap games. It's a very, very good reminder about what happened at the very last game, last home game last year. Against Ottawa, yes. Against Ottawa, yes. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure Montreal was looking past there was no question in my mind about it. Mm-hmm. They had a, an opportunity, they, uh, not much of an opportunity, but they had an opportunity uh, nonetheless to actually host the Eastern semifinal. And they let it slip through the fi- their fingers. Right. 
and it, it really did come down to Ottawa played a much better game towards the end. And I, I sincerely hope they learned that lesson. I hope they re- remember that from last year. Yeah, I agree. And they need to, you know what, considering that their record versus Ottawa at home, the Red Blacks has not been that good since the inception of the Red Blacks. I mean, the Owls are only 2-8 and eight at home versus Red Blacks. 2-8! and eight. Yeah. You know? So, I, again, we know it was lean years, yada, 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 but still... Well, you almost had some pretty leading years too. I mean, that's, but you that's, have to take uh, it. You have to take advantage. I mean, you have to take advantage of these. Of these, you know, last year they didn't do it. Again, we think they were looking ahead. You can't do it this week. Put no. everything aside. And it's kind of what Gino said in the press conference today. Even though what, what happened with VA, you need to put everything aside because if you show if you show too much emotion, it can get you into trouble on the field. Mm-hmm. Which I completely agree with. It was probably one of the cool, best things, best ways to put it. Because we know how close those two are. Yep. Put everything aside. Concentrate. Get this win. That hopefully it's twenty thousand plus again. Let's hope the weather's supposed to be, I think, quite nice. Well, nice weather. As I said, it's the kickoff to Labor Day weekend. So I mean, it's once again not a school night. So and it's a long weekend, baby. That's it. So I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think 20,000 might be asking a bit much, but I mean, I, I would like to see another decent crowd. I, I Again, if people remember how loud it was in that game versus Hamilton, if they remember, if the ones that were there remember the excitement throughout that game, mm-hmm. you know, exactly. that, 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 that good feeling, that, that, that excitement thinking, okay, the Alouettes, they're going to find a way, they're going to pull this off. And sure enough, they got the W and it was amazing. And I'm hoping that those fans remember that. And decide, yeah, we want to see that again. We want to make sure that happens again. And then if you can come and fill the stadium, folks, that would be amazing. And you know this team will reward you for it. Exactly. Um, just for those who are season ticket holders, you may have received a, a, an email this week. There has been a final confirmation that the season ticket holder day at Percival Molson will be taking place on, on Sunday, September 18th. Uh, you get to watch practice. I think it's from 11 to 2. I don't have the email in front of me. I think it's from 11 to 2. There are also some other goodies where for the entire month of September, the team is going to be celebrating you, the fans, and using the, you, the season ticket holders, with some specials uh, um, on discounts for the concessions and for the uh, for the boutique. So higher than normal uh, discounts. Your code is in your or ticket portal. Also, the team is giving you some free tickets for this for the uh, for September for the next three games. So again, head to your portal or refer to your email. But hey, it just shows that perks perks for being being an Alouette's uh, season ticket holder are pretty good. And oh, and yes, we are we got confirmation again too, as we reported a couple weeks ago, Cliff. We will be getting our season season ticket gift. Season ticket holders gift, which from what I'm understanding, a lot of teams, a lot of other teams don't do this, but we are going to be able to pick up our gift as of that uh, that day at Percival Molson Stadium. So, uh, by the way, I haven't seen it yet, Cliff, but I don't know what you're doing this this long weekend. If the Owls have their practice like they did this week on Monday at Percival Molson. Are you going to join me? Well, I'll see what my uh, Liberty plans are, but uh, I mean... Monday morning, uh, Monday morning or afternoon? Nah, it was morning. It was okay. morning. Oh well, no, I was, I was just thinking too because there there are two football games to watch. So, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 true. But I'm saying, you know, whatever your plans are, we'll talk. Your people will call my people. One hundred percent. There you go. So we appreciate you guys every week. Again, give us your feedback uh, by social, by our emails. Let us know what you think about the tooth. All this. Everything that's happened over this bye week and everything that's led up to what happened today with Vernon Adams, what are your thoughts um, about the team, about what they did? We'd love to hear your feedback and, and potentially, you know, to let us know what you think about uh, uh, who we can have on the show uh, over the next couple of weeks. And again, reminder, look out for social media for the launch of the contest to win two free tickets for the Sport Buff Flight Crew seats for the next home game on September 9th versus the BC Lions. So Cliff, I appreciate you, buddy. I will talk to you soon. And for everybody here at the Alouette's Flight Deck for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. One final approach.